Hello, I'm uh, Paul Beckwith, and in this video, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to uh, talk about my friend Alex Smith and his um, work with um, Radio Ecoshock. Um, so for 17 years, Alex has been <laughs> running radio a radio station program. Right now, it's broadcast um, on 104 or 105 nonprofit radio stations in five different countries. And uh, for most of the year, Alex does um, weekly shows. He interviews scientists, he interviews authors, you know, many famous people who are doing cutting edge work on, on climate change. And uh, sometimes, you know, for a few months in the summer, I think he, you know, plays some repeat programs and takes a bit of time off. But the program Radio Ecoshock is, you know, very, very important for bringing the ideas of scientists to the general public about the climate change um, threat that we face. So what I haven't seen, and I've known Alex for about 10 years, I've appeared on his program many times, usually, you know, twice a year, sometimes three times a year. You know, we're overdue for an interview, so I think when Alex sees this video, he might uh, call me and say, yeah, let's, let's talk again. So the reason why, um, the, the main reason why I'm doing this um, video now is because Alex, um, instead of interviewing scientists, he had a blog recently where he talked about what he thinks lies in our future, the near-term future, further out for humanity. And this is based, you know, I give a lot of weight to, to these ideas that he has because of his work, you know, and his incredible knowledge um, that he's gained from all of these scientists in interviews over the years. So I'm going to talk about, you know, this blog and some of his thoughts. And, you know, I'll make my own comments, of course, on things, you know, that I kind of support, things I might disagree with, etc. Um, before I do that, I just want to show this, um, you know, John Grissom book, The Rainmaker, written, I think, in 1995. An excellent, you know, fiction, an excellent novel. Um, really, really enjoying it. I'm not quite finished yet. The CO2 level in this room that I'm in was about uh, 900 parts per million, but I opened uh, three windows to get cross breezes, etc. And you can see on my meter, it's 776 parts per million right now. It also says 21.8 Celsius. 43% humidity. So as this video proceeds, I'll try to remember to show this um, monitoring and you'll see that the temperature should, it just drop. The temperature should drop significantly um, because, um, you know, it's about five Celsius outside. Okay, so this is, um, this is uh, ecoshock.org, radio ecoshock. Uh, uh, website and this is about Alex so you know he talks about the latest science he interviews scientists primarily authors he talks about issues from climate change to oceans forest pollution solar storms the economy and peace and uh, like I said his work is broadcast on 104 it says 104 it might be 105 105 up here Nonprofit radio stations in five countries. So, you know, it's basically he loves talking about the cutting edge with top scientists, authors, and activists. He's been on the air uh, for 17 years. And like I said, I've known him and been on his program, I think, for about a decade. Um, before that, he was researcher with the Global Environment Group, print journalist, homesteader, world traveler, and private investigator. You know, he's done... Um, very interesting work at his place in British Columbia, digging into the ground halfway and make, putting a greenhouse there, which can extend the growing season. And he self-funded Radio Ecoshock from the beginning. So 
you know, really follow him and, and try to support his work if you can. So that's my plug for Alex. Um, this is his uh, main, um, this is the, the main screen on his website. So he's got all bun all, a whole bunch of different shows here, like every week, like I said. And this is the one I'm going to talk about in this video. What I really think will happen is happening already. So he, uh, he very rarely talks about his own hopes and fears, but he, he opens up in this video. He talks about, so he's a longtime science journalist and he admits his own hopes and fears. And he talks about what he thinks for the future and maybe what sort of things that we can do. Um, okay, so this is the uh, show here. So he talks a little bit, you know, did, did humans already break the weather? So he talks about the, so this, this was published on April 5th, uh, just a few weeks ago on Radio Ecoshock. So, so he does a blog, um, which is posted on his website, along with the, the radio program. So he talked about the tornado destroying Rolling Fork, Mississippi, tracking for 90 miles or 145 kilometers. Um, you know, there were 59, 59 miles of tornado damage along the ground, all struck with powerful EF4 strength. So this was, there was a mass, the, the, you know, it was a massive tornado. EF4, very powerful. You know, our tornado is getting worse due to climate change. Yes, but not the way you think. So I talked, you know, a lot about the tornadoes and, and stuff, but he, he basically... This is what I really want to see. He breaks the rules of radio ecoshock. Instead of informed predictions by guests, as a longtime science journalist, he tells us what he really thinks. Alex Smith Unchained. Okay? Um, and he says, if this is your first time listening, this is not what to expect from this show. Okay, so talking about the tornado um, and, and the clusters and stuff, you know, he said that, uh, you know, Tornado Alley is shifting, as I've told you. The the number of days of tornadoes has not increased in, since the 1970s, but what we're getting is more clusters of tornadoes occurring on the days when there are tornadoes. So there's fewer days with tornadoes even, but more days with multiple tornadoes. Tornado Alley is shifting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a lot of... Um, problems. Um, they're shifting towards areas with more population in the east, puts more people at risk. Um, the geography further east makes it harder to see the tornadoes coming because it's not such flat terrain that it is in the existing tornado alley. Uh, people don't have protective basements, right? So houses are lifted right up from the, the concrete, uh, you know, base at ground level. So, you know, they're, they're moving to areas, these tornadoes are moving to areas where there's more people, but and there's not many storm, storm shelters because, you know, there wasn't even tornado sirens in these regions to roll the people, to, to warn the people in rolling forks. Um, you know, a lot of people in these counties are, have incomes below the poverty line. So it's very difficult for them to, um, th them to, uh, you know, rebuild when, when everything's destroyed. Um, insurance is lacking. Um, so he talks about, you know, some of the, uh, you know, in most of his blogs, we, he'll, he'll mention, you know, things that have happened in the last week. Um, you know, so sea level, um, the rate of sea level rise. Um, here's a paper I didn't look at yet. New LIDAR-based elevation model shows greatest increase in global coastal exposure to flooding to be caused by early stage sea level rise. So, you know, basically, you know, it looks like, you know, when the sea levels rise, the initial rise will cause a lot more damage than expected, affect more people. Um, because, you know, they're redoing the topography along coastlines. And there was some problems because, uh, you know, they weren't discriminating between the actual ground level and the height of the uh, trees canopy. Okay, so, so there's that paper. Um, you know, you can read this yourself. I'm, I don't need to go over everything. But, uh, you know, so what, 
do I think is going to happen? So this is very interesting because, you know, this is, uh, you know, like I said, um, you know, Alex very rarely does this sort of thing. I haven't seen this for, from him. I've encouraged him to do this and I've thought I should get him on the Climate Emergency Forum um, channel uh, where we do interview lots of different people. So we should do that soon. So after 16 or 17 years of broadcasting, he says he should probably own up to his own feelings about the future. And I, you know, I really respect Alex. I think he does a wonderful job with Radio EcoShock, does a wonderful job with getting out the message of climate change. So um, I was really excited to see um, some of his thoughts. So I'll say what I agree with and disagree with, most of what I agree with. So. Start with this, the coming decades will be the most stressful and challenging humans have known since the 1300s, with changes into, into social and physical landscapes never seen by any human. Okay, so what happened in the 1300s? I think he's talking about the dark ages, the, back, in the backward, the loss of science, the, you know, the superstition, the, um, you know, it was a very dark time for people. Lots of people starved to death. People didn't have very good lives. He said the severity of change in the coming decades may increase beyond the 2030s to include mass death events. So, yeah, you know, I think that's going to happen. Um, at first, these will seem shocking as a million or more people die in a few months or less. Like, you know, think of India, massive heat wave or something like that. Humans have seen such events on much smaller scale, for example, during periods of mass famine in India, but the population of India even two centuries ago was a fraction of today's population. So, you know, mass, mass deaths, mass deaths, death events. Um, now, so the challenges of trying to survive record long lasting heat waves, droughts, fire seasons, floods, all of them potentially lasting months plus stronger storms on coastlines, sea surges into city and agricultural land. These will all come to a population weakened by a decade of diseases. So when you have floods, when you have increasing heat baselines, you get, you get these things spread vector-borne diseases like those from tropical mosquitoes moving north and south into new populations. And I agree with this. The average human may have less energy a damaged immune system, lower intelligence, less stamina, and higher medical needs due to unrestrained repeated viral infections. Also, you know, this population will be trying to support large numbers of disabled and partially disabled people. Even if the social support networks fail, like nursing homes and hospitals, most people will try to keep family members alive at home. And that by itself is draining, even more draining if everyone has been damaged by the virus. So humans may have less vitality uh, when the worst climate impacts arrive. Um, during these hard and messy times, uh, people will fall deeply in love. You know, as long as humans are alive, I think that will happen. Many will have periods of happiness so strongly that alone would justify wanting to be alive. I mean, the survival instinct is very strong in, 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 human, or in humans. Um, you know, even now, knowing what I know, several hours a day, I feel some joy in my life, Alex says. We should not lose the ability to be happy. I mean, this is part of the human uh, condition. It keeps us sort of on an even keel. Um, science and innovation may continue, he says. The drive uh, will probably continue. And I, I, I agree with, with this as well. Um, that may sound strange when power gets knocked out from time to time as the weather or crowds rage. But once, I like how he puts that, as the weather or crowds rage, because as things go more chaotic, we'll get more crowds raging. Once electricity and data are known, it would take a lot of damage over a long period of time to knock it out. I am not among those who imagine the whole world just goes dark in one day, right? It's sort of death by a thousand cuts, I've often said. Um, you know, it would all go dark in one day if there was an accident, a war, or the ultimate hack. But the internet's designed to be pretty resilient and survive even the possibility of a nuclear war. It's generally distributed. 
So if big chunks of it went down, a lot of it would be paralyzed, but new connections would be made. Solar power adds a source of very local electricity for at least a decade or two. Um, science and medical research might be able to continue despite a general weakening and dislocation due to health and environmental th threats. The juggernaut of science we have now may not last more than a decade or two, but some science may continue until the species really loses power and communication. Some of the basics of science, including the makeup of gases in the atmosphere, were discovered in private labs using glass globes and early instruments before electricity. Same with mineral and chemical studies. Astronomy was launched in the 1700s. So, so human knowledge and invention may continue despite what the pessimists say. Um, predation of the last of nature. Okay, I think, you know, this is definitely going to happen. Um, you know, um, we've shown little ability for self-control of our consumption or desires. So nature will probably continue to lose species and spaces at alarming rates. Um, you know, as, as food um, supplies get restricted, as there's hunger, this predation of the last of nature will continue, even though and partly because of repeated crisis conditions. So the economy of production and consumption sort of business as usual right now, will likely continue for the next decade or two, he thinks, unless there's a mass revolution, nuclear war, or some cataclysmic driver of sudden change. Continuing consum consumption of, of the planet will seek out the last resources and plunder and waste them, so it will drive other species out of their habitats, leading to chains of extinction, which we will only see in hindsight, if at all. So. There'll be breakdowns in supply chain problems that last for years. If the larger social system cannot cope, masses of humans will range out into nature looking for food. This is already happening in some countries due to current population expansion. So think of like the idea of bushmeat in tropical Africa, for example. You know, and if the power system and banks go out in one region, after a few days without food, all those people with guns will go out and shoot whatever meat they can find. So say goodbye to ducks, geese, farm animals, deer, most mammals, and some plants. We need food now. We need to survive. So the wildlife will be decimated. Some will not return. The point, whether the production consumption system limps on or fails, Right? In either case, more of nature will be damaged. So what are the likely human responses? What will we do? Well, a couple unorganized thoughts. You know, these things are very difficult to predict. Like, you know, people that say we're gonna go extinct, you know, in three years are they're 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 in a they're basically not thinking straight. They're not thinking rationally. It's almost cult like thinking. So, you know, what are the alternatives? Well, I think uh, Alex Smith has put together a lot better uh, scenarios than the idea that we all go extinct in three years. You know, that doomerism just, you know, does, doesn't make sense to, to me and many other people, but, you know, many people are falling for it. So, so here, uh, life expectancy may decrease. This is probably a likelihood. You know, when life expectancy decreases, there's an inc there's a corresponding attempt to increase reproduction. So humans could return to the short lifespans that were normal during most centuries until the 1900s with bigger families. So there's an interesting study of, of uh, you know, these lemurs of Madagascar, how, they, how they're handling climate change. So a paper in March 27, 2023, um, you know, gave a good insight into, into the, these species and you know, has implications to maybe how humans may adapt to increasing climate ex extremes and continuing viral loads, all tending to a shorter lifetime. Okay, uh, you know, the government of the UK just dropped the measure to raise the retirement age to 68. Now that life expectancy is dropping there, mainly due to COVID. Okay, so the, um, the study of the short-lived mammal in Madagascar, the lemur, says the climate trends tend to decrease survival rates for the lemur as well as increase reproduction rates. The contrasting demographic trends have prevented population collapse, but destabilize the population by further speeding up their life cycle through in increased re reproduction and reduced 
lifespan. So think of earlier centuries with humans. Humans often mated or married shortly after puberty when reproduction was possible. A 14-year-old male was already in whatever workforce or army um, would provide food. The 14-year-old female was bearing children. Average life expectancy was 35 to 40 years old. The average is slightly biased because it includes the very high death rate of babies and mothers in birth in those times. A few people lived into their 60s or beyond, but few. One of the most famous warrior kings of England was considered very old and infirm with diseases of old age at 48. Because so many children would be lost, there would be large families, often as large as the woman or several wives lived to reproduce. So, you know, are we already past peak life expectancy, okay? Uh, exactly like the lemurs, humans may have decreased survival rates and increased productive rates. Given the coming times of extreme stress, decades of normalized crisis, humans may live shorter lives but produce more children, which could keep the world population in the multi-billions despite numbing losses in mass death events. Okay, so we may have already passed peak life expectancy. Um, of course, increased reproduction and compensation assumes that chemicals or radiation in the environment have not all already increased st sterility in males or females. Evidence is growing that male sterility in developed countries is growing. In that case of decreased sterility, the strategy of reproducing the species to cope with lower immunity during higher extremes and violent weather may not work, so the population declines then, perhaps relatively rapidly, say over a decade or three, punctuated by events of obvious mass deaths. So this would reduce the human burden on natural systems, but only after most of those systems have been pushed into the hot world phase. So, you know, another thought, um, you know, we may actually fix some things. Right, human responses to decades of crisis may surprise us. We might fix some things added to general understanding of how the planet operates along with continuing innovation. It may bring new unexpected benefits to, for humans. So we may find a cure, for example, for all varieties of coronaviruses, maybe a technology to help the body repair previous damage to the immune system. Anti-aging science is continuing. Um, this could slightly offset population loss due to climate extremes. Now, just stay home, right? So how about this? Humans respond to long crisis by just staying home. Sound familiar? Last few years, are you staying home more? Many people I talked with are. So, you know, um, is this, uh, you know, carry over from the, the pandemic continuing? I mean, many right now, uh, you know, there's something like 150,000 government workers um, in Canada who are on strike. And one of their sticking points is they want to maintain the ability to stay to work at home. Um, you know, I think 45 percent of them work at home right now compared to the the, 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 the sort of the norm um, in, in uh, Canada of about 25 percent total. But, you know, people can actually save money and time by working at home. So there's a big desire of people to do that. Of course, that hollows out the, uh, the, the downtown core of, of cities uh, because, you know, with all the office buildings and so on, with them not being needed. So maybe they could be converted to, to uh, apartments and things. I don't know. But, you know, the businesses in downtown cores of cities is being greatly, you know, is, is really struggling still. So, you know, he gives an anecdote where they were walking and they met an older couple in the village. They were staying home during the continuing pandemic risk, not going out, not much so social life, but they were house happy. Millions of us are shrinking into our homes for good reason. Actually, without all the flying and consumption, house happy can be better for the planet, closer to the human animal we really are. You know, maybe home cooking will increase health too. So, you know, Alex expects the isolated cellular lifestyle or insular lifestyle will increase. It may not become a majority, perhaps should not, but, you know, it probably describes a significant part of the population in coming decades. Now, you know, in the past, when a 
barbarian army arrive to a rich land with few defenders. Some of the local population runs away, but the majority go into their houses and stay there, waiting to see what happens, hoping to make it through, hoping for better days. This is where we are today with both the pandemic, climate change, and social instability. Poll after poll shows the majority of humans with any education, no big trouble is coming. They're stressed and afraid in great numbers. They're staying home on climate change. You know, and here's another thing. Well, maybe this will happen, maybe it not. It won't happen, but you know, maybe humans may develop a fact-based belief system. How naive. <laughs> humans may develop a fact-based belief system as strong as religion leading us to live peacefully and properly with nature. We return to a state of respect and awe for other creatures on this planet. We aim to make the world richer, not poorer, to help and do the least harm. Okay, uh, no one can say with proof or certainty this is not possible. Does a better humanity become harder to imagine just before the egg cracks open? So, you know, you can look at what our basic needs are. We must eat, we must find shelter, we must have drinking water. Um, that does not mean that the current carnival of destruction must continue apparently without guilt or even awareness. Um, you know, the first inhabitants of North America, First Nations people, they did kill other mammals to eat, but for thousands of years, they carried a culture of awareness, respect, and dependence on their prey. It was a tradition to apologize to the rabbit or deer for needing to eat them. So, you know, is this possible to happen again with humanity? We can't say it won't happen. We just don't know. Um, we may return to humble living, even though it sounds impossibly distant, things may be closer than they appear in the rearview mirror. So some academics and activists are already working on various lifeboat responses like managed retreat. Now I love this term, uh, sustainable growth, you know, just can't happen, right? I mean, the sustainable development goals just can't happen. You know, managed retreat is really what we need to think about. Managed retreat physically from coastlines where sea level is rising rapidly, manage retreat from the the economic system and the you know what we do in in in, in life now manage retreat columbia university is holding a recurring event at what point manage retreat the transition town movement is quieter but it's still going others develop the future of humanity institute various attempts at deep time think tanks to see a way ahead Check out the new report, Future Proof. Okay, so at what point, point might this happen? So this is a conference, you know, June 20th to the 23rd at Columbia um, this, this year. At what point manage retreat, habitability and mobility in an era of climate change? I should really consider maybe, uh, maybe heading down to this conference, renting a car and heading down. Okay, so Alex peers into a disturbed future. So we may actually, um, these may be the first steps towards surviving the future we made. We may actually prepare enough to keep learning and innovation alive, avoiding another dark age or de-enlightenment instead of the enlightenment. You know, and there's a crowd of people that are thinking of this. Human readiness and prepared tools may make the journey less ugly, at least for some people. Humans may respond better than our strong pessimism suggests. Who knows, we may develop many more positive social traits and even the ability to be happier with much less. Nobody can guarantee that, but nobody can guarantee we go out in brutish violence either. We just don't know. Um, and so he goes on, he talks about, you know, anybody can sell novels on gloom and doom, like The Road or The Lord of the Flies, but the future may be um, less eye-catching and better at least better than the worst version of humanity. Doomery is understandable, but Doomer absolutists have overreached. You know, Doomer absolutists, like people saying, okay, it's 2023. Every human on the earth will be dead in 2026. And anybody that says otherwise is crazy or has hopium or whatever. So these are Doomer absolutists and they've definitely overreached. We, there's no certainty how all this would turn out. Anyone who says they are certain has fallen back into self-delusion. The physics of climate, the operations of microbial threats, these things may be known, but the human response is not. 
okay? And Alex actually gives a plug. I had a whole video on this book on collective illusions. So, um, so basically, um, and so there, there's papers, social tipping points for stabilizing Earth's climate by 2050. So the idea of social tipping points, and I, I might be the one who first came up with that phrase, uh, social tipping points, you know, many, many years ago. But, you know, history shows a few examples of revolution, times of sudden social change. So institutions and foundational ideals fail to be replaced by the new, or they fall to be replaced by the new. So think of the French Revolution in 1789, the baby boom generation hoped 1968 would break down war, hate, and injustice. Soviet Union looked invincible, but suddenly collapsed in 1991. So societies can change very rapidly. We need this one to change quickly away, not just from fossil fuels, but the destruction of nature, which includes destroying each other. We too are gifts of nature. So Todd Rose wrote this book in the 2022 book, Collective Illusions, Conformity, Complicity, and the Science of Why We Make Bad Decisions. So, so Alex gives a plug for me here, who brought this book to his attention. In, I did a YouTube video on the book. And like, how, like Alex, I've come to the, realize the threat to our continued happiness and existence is not because we lack science or technology, we know and we know how we are missing something within ourselves. We need to solve the communal code leading to destruction. And there's a link to my video there. You know, so think of medieval people burning women said to be witches. That horrible delusion infected everyone from royalty down to the village blacksmith. It was led by a male dominated church supposed to protect humanity from the worst human impulses. You know, later, in, in allegedly in the modern age, of course, Germans led mass slavery and execution of Jews, World War II. You know, it was all a horrible collective illusion. We desperately need to find out how malcoding of human minds develops and how to heal. Now, I would go beyond that and say, you know, it's a power imbalance in society. It's a malcoding of, of people, you know, with way too much money and way too much power. And they're ju they just try to accumulate more and more piles of money and power, and they don't give a hoot about, about the rest of society, even though they say they do. So Todd Rose was a co-founder and president of a Boston-based think tank called Populous. Um, and he's written a few books. And he says, he explains why humans could change more rapidly than we imagine. You know, worse yet for absolute doomers, he finds that most humans have a better nature than we generally think. Um, you know, so he he did television, telephone surveys. Um, you know, and I, I agree with this completely. Like, I, you know, I've done some storm chasing in the past years in the U.S. And, you know, you hear of all these gun deaths and turmoil in the U.S., political disruption. You know, I drive over the border, you know, I go into, you know, red states, blue states, you know, talk to people and, you know, most people are, are, are decent people, right? You really, you really, you know, I know a lot of people in Canada fear going to the U.S. now because of what they hear. But most people are good at heart. Um, but so, you know, we, but the better side of people might still win, you know, even if, even you doubters cannot prove that evil will triumph in coming years. The only honest answer is no one knows, right? So, you know, he talks about he more heating, um, equilibrium in our future, stop, stop trying to simple hard number for warming. You know, um, you won't recognize this new planet. The planet that's coming would be almost unrecognizable. You know, in the last year alone, the European Alps lost 6% of the snow and ice mass, right? So great belts of desert are expanding across the world. You know, look at the, it looks like the African, North African deserts have crossed over into Europe, into Spain, you know, record temperatures right now there in April. Um, Southwest US, many places are running out of water for cities and agriculture. 
Uh, here, Alex actually says to the the African desert moves north into southern Europe. This is this is happening. You know, um, you know the massive storms. You know, so you can talk about all these things. I did a video on this. Remember this image here. The extent to which current and future generations will experience a hotter and different world depends on choices now and in the near future. This was in the, the new IPCC report, which just came out. Okay, so I had a whole video on this. Um, you know, we the children are coming. They're, they're, you know, seniors are taking action, going on climate protests. Um, right, so they're, you know, we just, we just basically... You know, I thought Alex did a wonderful job in putting down his thoughts on, on paper, you know, in his blog. And it puts me to sh shame a bit. I mean, I do all the videos. I talk about all of these things. But I think I, you know, if I, I need to start writing some, some blogs of, you know, what, what I think is going on. Because, you know, contrast what Alex is saying to what somebody like, um, you know, what some other people are saying. Like one person in particular, you know, we're all dead by 2026. I mean, and there's such a following of people that believe that, and that's very, very harmful to to their to their psyches. And you know, we just don't know. So if anybody is saying anything with certainty, then that's a lot of uh, baloney and nonsense. You know, this um, view that Alex Smith has put down on paper um, in his blog put down on paper, digital paper, um, I think is a much more realistic uh, viewpoint of, of what we can expect in, in the near term future, maybe in the next few decades. Okay, so I highly recommend that you uh, check out this particular blog and article. You know, I skimmed through lots of parts. I tried to cover some of the most important parts. Um, Alex Smith and following his program is a great thing for you to put on your weekly agenda to listen to his shows and read his blog. It's well worth your time. So thanks again for listening. And I'll just give a little plug for my uh, blog, paulbeckwith.net. Please consider donating to my PayPal to support my research and videos. Okay, thanks. Bye for now.